So good evening. Today is our week ten session, and in today's session, uh, this session will also be the interactive session in which we'll be practicing MCQs related to the week ten topics such as supervised machine learning, in which you have looked into the predictive analysis, marker selection, and we have also uh, means done a hand-on analysis of this web web guest art. So we'll look into it that how to work with this and how to observe the outputs which are given by this tool so along with that we'll also discuss few of the topics which will be related to the mcqs so that will clear your doubts completely yeah so this is the first mcq so i request that uh, you can uh, the right it answer in the chat and i'll be looking it and then we'll discuss that what will be the right answer so the first question is which of the following is false in respect to random forest and decision tree option a random forest is a collection of multiple decision trees option b random forest are built using the bagging model option c decision trees are prone to overfitting when compared to random forest and option d both belongs to unsupervised learning so you have to tell which one is false So if you have any clue, then you can write. Otherwise, we'll discuss that what will be the right option. Okay, then let's see. Yeah, so it's right option is that both belongs to unsupervised learning. So this option is false, and rest other options are true. Now let's look that what is the explanation for other options. So the first option was that random forest is a collection of multiple decision trees. so in the previous lectures also we have seen that decision tree is a single entity but when we combine the result of multiple decision trees and we take a probability from all of them then it becomes a random forest which include multiple decision trees so it means option a is correct now option b says that random forests are built using the bagging model so bagging model means the model in which there is a bootstrap aggregation so bootstrap means when you repeat something again and again and aggregation means when you combine something so uh, that's why the random forest is the bagging model which uh, bag or which you can say bootstrap aggregates all the decision trees so that's why option b was also correct whereas option c says that decision trees are prone to overfitting when compared to random forest so this option is also true because in decision tree there is a single tree so there are more chances that you might overfit but in random forest as we are aggregating multiple decision trees so there are lesser chances of overfitting so that's why option c was also correct whereas option d is not right because both belongs to unsupervised learning this is not true because both belongs to supervised learning algorithms and not unsupervised so this is the example that uh, how a decision tree looks and how a random forest looks so if you see the decision tree is a single entity in which there is a single tree in which multiple decisions are taken and it is uh, forming a tree like shape whereas in random forest there are multiple decision trees which you can see here and all these decision trees their uh, probability is calculated and ultimately the output will be in the form of the binary code means it will be either yes or no zero or one so that's uh, what it is representing and if we want to compare the decision tree and random forest then first of all there is a interpretability which is a characteristic so which means uh, how easily you can interpret the results so in case of decision tree it is easy to interpret because there is only a single tree but when we talk about random forest then they are a bit hard to interpret because you are combining multiple decision trees so it becomes hard for interpretation whereas if accuracy is concerned then in decision trees accuracy can vary because a single decision tree is taken whereas in random forest because multiple decision trees are taken so the output will be the average average value so that's why the chances that its accuracy will be comparatively higher than the decision tree whereas if we talk about overfitting then in decision tree there are chances that the data might overfit whereas if we talk about the random forest then it is unlikely to overfit the data if we talk about out outliers then in decision tree there are chances that it will be affected by the outliers whereas in case of random forest there are less chances and it is robust against the outliers then if we talk about computation so in decision tree it is quick to build whereas in random forest it is computationally intensive 
as we know that it is incorporating information from multiple decision trees that's why it is slow to build so there therefore we can conclude that both the decision tree as well as random forest offer few advantages whereas means both of them have some uh, means advantages and some disadvantages associated with them so it depends on us that what are the features which we are looking for so that's why we can select any one of them now here is a question number second yeah so overfit actually practically means because when we are building a model or a prediction model so what we do is we take certain features that uh, which features should be given more preference for example if uh, i want to classify between different types of fruits for example apple and banana so there are multiple features such as their shape their size their weight their sweetness their color so there are multiple features so in overfitting what happen is that you have the extensive data which is already available and there are multiple features so one thing is that people what they do is that if we have multiple parameters or multiple features which are available so people try to use all the features but that is not true because if you try to use all the features then it will also capture the noise or you can uh, say that uh, it's not true that all the fruits will be able to uh, distinguish on all those features there are only limited number of features which vary among different fruits for example in apple and banana it's uh, for example if you take its sweetness so both are sweet so in that case for example if you include another fruit which is less sweet to them so if you take sweetness as a parameter so it might interfere you might not be able to distinguish them properly so that's why that is known as overfitting when you try to use all those features which might not apply on all the or the new data set for example if i add citrus fruit to that so in that case if i will compare the sweetness in that case i won't be able to uh, categorize or classify all of them all three of them separately i will get confused so that is known as overfitting because when you are training your data on a specific data set and whenever new data comes then it might not uh, settle or it might not fit well with those features so that's why you should be very careful while selecting those features so those features are mostly preferred which are mostly varying so that is gen in the general meaning of overfitting so in the later slides we'll see means uh, in terms of this protogenomics that what overfitting means okay so the next question is that which of the following methods can be useful in determining the optimal parameters for predictive models so option a is gradient descent option b is database search option c is multiple testing correction and option d is none of the above yeah so you already have uh, gone through this in your lecture so that's why you are right option a is correct which is the gradient descent method so gradient descent is an optimization algorithm which is used to find the optimal parameters or weights in a model so as we have seen overfitting so similarly what gradient descent is doing that you have multiple features so it provide weight to each and every feature so weight means that what is the preference how you are prioritizing all the features so in some instances it can happen that uh, certain features might not be important so in that case you give them as low weight as 0. Point something so those features might not be getting more priority so in that case you are kind of ignoring those features for classification or for prediction uh, perspective so that's a, a gradient descent is very important so that you can optimize your algorithm so that it can give better output so that is known as gradient descent and what happen in these algorithm is that you kind of trying to do it again and again so that in the end better output is generated because whenever you are designing any predictive models or anything so you have all the data and you divide it into a training set and a test set so what happen is that you already have all the results so that's why when you are training your model on a training set then whenever you give the inputs from the test set so you already know what is the output so then when you try to predict and you get certain outputs so you compare them that what should be their expected outputs and what are the observed outputs so you check for the difference that how much difference your model is giving so you kind of try to optimize it again and again so that the difference could be decreased so that is the main purpose of gradient descent so in that case you try to reprioritize again and again all the parameters so that better weights can be given to each parameter so that the output which is uh, observed that should be most nearest to the expected output whereas if we talk about database search so it simply means it's not any method of optimization it means you're simply searching through the database so it is generally used when you are designing the model so when you are gathering the information so this step comes under that 
whereas multiple testing correction so we have also seen that this comes under statistical analysis when you are trying to predict or you are trying to prove your algorithm or uh, sorry prove your hypothesis so in that case you use multiple testing correction in which you adjust your p value in the statistical tests so it's for that and then none of the above is also not true because gradient descent is the right answer so before moving further i just want to give you a brief overview of the machine learning models so this is just a base for basic understanding so i am taking example of uh, neural networks in this case because there are multiple machine learning models and neural network is one among them so just for simplicity so as we know in biological neuron we have multiple dendrites and then in the end we have the synapse so how a neuron transfer information from one end to another end it receives the input from the dendrite and then that information travels through these exons and ultimately it reaches the this point which is known as synapse where the two neurons are joining together so synapse is a point from where information is passed on to next neuron or whatever where the information has to be passed so similarly in machine learning models the another term for the biological neuron is the artificial neuron or the perceptron and when multiple neurons are connected so it forms a neural network so as in the biological network we see there are multiple exons multiple these bodies cell bodies or you can say multiple these exons are present so similarly in um, perceptron or art artificial network also we we could have multiple layers so this is a perceptron in which we only have a single layer we do not have multiple layers so what happen is there are multiple inputs so these inputs are nothing but the parameters for example uh, as i have given the example of the fruit classification problems in that case inputs could be uh, different features color taste weight smell so all these will be the input which is referred to as x x x to xn and then weights are the how much weights or how much priority you are giving to each feature so that comes under weights so there will be some weights so first of all whenever you are try to design a model so firstly you give the random weights to each and every parameter so this will be random in the beginning then you will uh, perform the weighted sum so weighted sum is that for each and every feature you will be having some value so you will multiply that value with this particular weight and then you will sum all the features means all these multiplicated values will be summed in this case so when they are summed then their output will be given and there will be a step function so what the step function provides is that you have multiple values in the input for example you want to classify a fruit so there will be multiple features but in the end what you want is that you want a single result that whether it is a apple banana mango what it is so output is only single so that's why after performing the weighted sum you need a step function so that it can provide a single output so now there are multiple step functions we won't go into their detail and in ultimately you will receive a output so it is kind of behaving like a biological neuron in which it is collecting information and giving the information giving a single output from here so this is also the another interpretation that we have a data we divide it into a training set and a test set for training set we already have the known answers we try to um, means train our model and then we provide the input from the test set and try to make predictions so now these predictions their observed outputs will be compared with the known answers for those test set and their errors will be calculated so error means what is the difference between the values so in this case uh, for example if your values are not like yes or no if they are some uh, values in like of in point 1 1 or if they are continuous values in that case you will be calculating their differences or for example if your value is like a categorical value that for fruit name so in that case also the error will be the wrong value so in that case it will be considered as a error and then you will try to minimize the error by using the optimization algorithms which is gradient descent in this context there are other algorithms also but majorly gradient descent is the one which is used by default because it is considered better than other algorithms but although there are other algorithms also which exist so it is most commonly used and it train the machine learning model by the means of minimizing errors between actual and expected results so that's why its name is gradient descent because it believes that the this is the minimum cost so cost here means that what is the difference so cost is meaning what is the difference between the actual value and the observed value so what you want is that there should be minimum cost so if we try to plot it into the weight and the cost x and y axis 
then we want our value to be here which is near the minimum cost and this is referred to as the gradient which is like a slope so we are trying to move down the gradient that's why it is a gradient descent descent means we are moving down and gradient means to in the gradient so slowly and slowly multiple steps will be taken so what multiple step means that we are changing the weight values by some uh, in some values so each and every time we will add something to the weight or we'll subtract something from the weight so with each change in that error or cost will also change so we try to reduce the cost as much as possible so that is known as incremental step because we do not know how much to reduce so we are trying to uh, slowly and slowly change those weights and ultimately we want to reach to the minimum cost so it's not always possible to reach to the level of minimum cost or where error is completely zero but yeah we can achieve the maximum accuracy or the means most closest point to the minimum cost so now let's move to question number 3 so is it clear till now about gradient descent okay yeah so now question number 3 is which of the following is true in regards to linear regression and logistic regression so option a is logistic regression regression requires little or no multicollinearity among the independent values option b linear regression results in a best fit straight line option c linear regression requires a linear relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable and option d logistic regression predicts the value of categorical variables so you have to tell which one is true in regard to linear and logistic so which should include both the linear regression concept as well as logistic regression concept okay so polymy said c and d Sujita, do you want to make any guesses, or do you have any idea? Yes, see. Okay, so the correct answer is option D, which is the logistic regression predicts the value of categorical variables. So uh, let's look for all the options. So the first option was. that logistic regression requires little or no multicollinearity among the independent variables so this is false because if we talk about multicollinearity so it can be issue in logistic regression so that's why it is not fitting here because in this we in logistic regression we try to predict the categorical values not though means we cannot go for the multicollinearity then comes linear regression results in a best fit straight line so this is also means confusing statement it is true but it is incomplete because it describes the characteristics of linear regression but doesn't compare it to the logistic regression so we cannot select this option then comes linear regression requires a linear relationship between the dependent and independent variables so again here also it is true but it is again incomplete because it is not taking into consideration the logistic regression then comes the option d which was the logistic regression predicts the values of categorical variables so this is also true because logistic regression is used for the classification task and it takes the categorical values so this uh, actually this question was present in your previous year assignment so this option is also a bit confusing because so if uh, we have to go for the multiple selective answers so in that case option c d as well as option b is bit incomplete but still these all options are kind of make sense and which are true regarding the linear and logistic regression so c and d would be the right answer for this but if you have only a single option to select so in that case option d is the most preferred which they have mentioned okay so here is a comparison between the linear regression and logistic regression so in linear regression the output will be predicted between 0 and 1 range and it will be some uh, continuous value for example 0 point something something so it will be a straight line and it will follow the linear regression curve whereas if we talk about logistic regression so it its value will also lie between 0 and 1 but most of the cases uh, if the value will expand above certain threshold then it will be categorized as 1 and if it will be below this threshold then it will be categorized as 0 so it will give the value in the means in terms of the categories that yes no for example in the linear regression if we want to look for the percent of pumpkin sales if we have a pumpkin its size and we are trying to see that if the size increases how the sale is affected so in case of linear regression 
the curve which will be plotted which will show that how the sale is increasing so we are predicting that with this particular size what is the percentage of sale so that percentage is a number which is in continuous terms in continuous scale which will not be complete to one it will be some continuous value one point something something so that is known as continuous values so in case of linear regression we are getting that value in points whereas in logistic regression we simply predict that whether it is yes or no so in this case with pumpkin size we are trying to predict the pumpkin color so there are only two categories that side it is known as categorical predictor or binary predictor so it will simply tells that with each size what are the chances that my pumpkin will be orange in color or it will not be orange so uh, that's why it will have some threshold value and it will predict that in terms of binary output so this is the main difference between the linear regression and logistic regression and this was just an example in machine learning model the means in proteogenomics the examples might vary among different genes and proteins and here is a table if you want to read in more detail that what are the main main differences so you can go through this slide so now let's move to question number 4 which says which of the following metrics is used to evaluate a regression model so option a accuracy option b precision option c recall and option d mean squared error which is known as msc so you have to evaluate the linear regression model so in linear regression you know that we have the continuous values now you have to decide in which metrics we can evaluate it that whether it is performing better or not okay so you both have mentioned option d and yeah it is correct so we use mean squared error for measuring that whether it is uh, means for evaluating the regression model that whether its predictions are accurate or not so when we say accuracy so accuracy is used for evaluation but for the classification models and not for the regression models in similarly for the precision also it is also used for the classification task similarly recall is also used for the classification task whereas mean squared error is used for these regression models and it try to measure the average square difference between the predicted and the actual values so there is a formula to it so that's why it calculates the average squared difference now in the next slide we'll see so whenever you want to evaluate any modeling machine learning so there are two categories one is that if you want to evaluate for the classification problems and another is for the regression problems so in classification problems the matrices which we have are accuracy precision recall f1 score and area under the curve whereas in case of regression problems we have mean squared error root mean squared error mean absolute error and r2 score so let's look in little in detail into these uh, uh, metrics so first of all we have the actual class and predicted class so now whenever we are training the model so as i mentioned earlier that we have a training set and a test set so for all that data we already know that what should be the actual results so that's why we have the actual class and in this case we are considering the classification models this particular confusion matrix is for the classification kind of problems so we know the actual class and we also know what are the prediction our model is making so true positive is the value whenever our model is predicting exact same value as the actual class so that will be referred to as true positive that means our predictions are positive and they are truly positive because in actual also the prediction is same whereas false negative means that you are predicting something but it is the false uh, false negative that means uh, for example you are predicting some value which is actually which should be true according to the actual class but you are predicting it wrong so that is false negative and then comes false positive that means your prediction is saying that value to be true but it is false according to the actual class whereas in uh, case of true negative which means that according to actual class also the value is negative and you are also predicting it to be false or negative so that means it is the true negative so you are means able to uh, say that these negative values are negative so that is known as true negative so when we say accuracy so what accuracy means that you calculate the sum of true positive and true negative which means that how many values which were actually positive and you also mentioned them as positive plus true negative means how many values were negative and you also predicted predicted them to be negative that means how much accuracy you means how much values were accurately or exactly predicted by your method divided by total predictions that were made 
including true positive true negative false positive false negative so out of all those predictions how many were exactly correct so that is accuracy when we say precision it means that out of all the positive values how many positive values we have uh, identified accurately so that means true positive divided by true positive plus false positive so out of all the uh, so in this case out of all the positive values which were predicted how many were accurate so that is known as precision whereas if we talk about recall so it means from all the positive values present in the actual class how many positives we could be able to identify so a precision and recall is a little bit confusing so in precision all the positives which are predicted so we divide the true positives by the all the predicted positive values whereas in case of recall we divide it by all the actual positive values which should be predicted so that's why uh, in some cases you will also see that there is a curve which is known as precision recall curve which is also plotted to check that your model is performing good or no so we need to combine multiple matrices because one single matrix cannot give us the correct picture so that's why then comes f1 score so this is also the harmonic mean of precision and recall values so it include both precision and recall that's why maximum people go for the f1 score calculation similarly area under curve is also a plot which tells how much area is present between so in this case also we will include precision and recall and then we will make a plot and we will calculate the area which is falling under the accuracy values so this is all about the performance matrix for classification problems and in regression problems we have some formulas so we already know that in mean squared error we will be performing the mean of the we will performing the mean square of the differences which are coming between the actual and the predicted values and then we will take its mean and we will perform the square root of that we will uh, sorry we will square the differences and then we will take the mean of all those values which are obtained similarly in root mean square we will take the square root of all those values from the mean squared error and mean absolute error is when we are taking the mean of the absolute value of errors so in that case uh, means we are not squaring it but we are absoluting it so if negative value is obtained so we will just absolute it that means we will consider it to be positive only so that is known as mean absolute error and similarly r2 score is also there which is the percentage of dependent variable explanation of the independent variable in the data set so this is not of our concern majorly mean square error or root mean square error are mostly preferred for the performance metrics yeah so this is also the another representation of the accuracy precision recall and f1 means f1 score calculations so this we already have discussed so is it clear till now or do you have any confusion regarding those matrices okay thank you so now next question is which term describes a model that performs well on the training data but poorly on test data so option a is o underfitting option b is generalization option c is overfitting and option d is optimization okay yeah so you both are right option c is correct which is overfitting so what overfitting means that you are performing so overfitting although you are setting multiple parameters so it will with the training data your output will be best output which you will get but whenever you will take another new value then it will give you the trouble so that's why it is also mentioned that a model which is performing well on training data but poorly on the test data is regarded to be the instances of overfitting so when we talk about underfitting it occurs when the model is too simple to capture the underlying patterns in the training data so underfitting will happen when you only select the limited number of parameters so that's why you're not able to better able to distinguish values so that is underfitting when we talk about generalization so generalization is a general term which refers to the model's ability to perform well on the unseen data so generalization is kind of a step or we can say its ability where we are trying to optimize so that thing is known as generalization in which the parameters are generalized and because uh, between underfitting and overfitting we have the thing which is known as generalization where you are generalizing the parameters so that it can perform better on the test data or you can say unseen data and overfitting happens when the model learns the training data too well it captures its noise and details in such a way that whenever if new data is given so it will perform poorly because it is not exposed to those new noises or no, new errors 
and then optimization is also a process as we have seen in the gradient descent which tries to change the weights and biases so that your, your model can give the better output so that is known as optimization so here is a difference between the underfit overfit and optimum which is sometimes referred to as generalization so these are the lines which are trying to separate the stars from these dots so underfit is also referred to as higher bias models whereas if you say overfit that means there is high variance although the bias is less so in this case i want to show you that what bias and variance is showing so when we say low variance that means between those points the difference is very less they are very close uh, closely present to one another so that is known as low variance whereas bias means you are not biased to something so in this case if we talk about this blue circle means uh, there are multiple concentric circles so in this case when we talk about the blue circles so we are not biased to this region because we want to make we want to classify these uh, these points that to which means we want to classify them into different classes so in this case the bias is very low they are not that much different from one another and their variance is also very low they are very closely packed to one another whereas if these um, means points are separated from one another but they are kind of spread among all these concentric circles they are not specific to a single circle so in that case bias is already low and the variance is high because they are uh, means far spread from one another so this is high bias that means if we talk about this blue concentric circle so these points are all present in this particular circle so this is biased towards this region and they are very closely present so there is low variance among them whereas if we talk about high variance so in this case the variance is very high and bias is also high because they are not means concern means fixed to this particular circle they are not biased to this particular region they are spread so in this case bias is also high and variance is also high so what ideally we want to do is that we want to balance these bias as well as variance so that the predictions are better so in this case there is underfit we are not exactly able to distinguish them properly this is optimum where we are trying to optimize it so that maximum better separation could be done among these two points in overfit we are kind of performing to means we are trying to do it best because here you can see that we are completely segregating both the stars as well as green dots but whenever a new dot will come or new value will come then it this this will give the problem so that's why although there is low training error but when we will give the test data then it will give the huge error which will be the high test error so in this case training error is also low and test error will also be low whereas in this case the training error is high and ultimately if you will give another new value so test error will also be high so in optimum we are just we are not saying that we do not want any error we will get some error but it will be lesser that's why we means opt for this optimum models yeah now let's move to next question okay yeah in first example because in this case they have considered this blue region to be the region of bias so in that term means in, in that case that's why they have highlighted it to be blue so in that case they are not calling it to be the biased region that they are not biased to that particular because those values should be present in this blue concentric circle otherwise if we means talk about this red dot then yeah they are highly biased towards this red region but means this bias is calculated in perspective of this blue concentric circle that's why means for the comparisons they have taken this that's why they mentioned that it is low bias this was just example that's why otherwise means if all those circles are considered so in that case yeah it appears to be biased to that red circle so next question is which of the following is a linear model used in the supervised learning so option a is linear regression option b is decision trees option c is random forest and option d is k nearest neighbors okay so let's see what is the right answer oh sorry so the correct answer is option a which is the linear regression so it is a linear model which is used in supervised learning so 
so we already have seen the linear regression that it predicts the relationship between the independent as well as the dependent variables using the straight line so with straight line it tries to categorize both the dependent and independent variables it calculate the values and then decision trees so decision trees are known known linear model that split the data based on the feature values to make the predictions in random forest also because it is uh, trying to assemble or it try to aggregate all the decision trees so that's why this is also not the linear model and in case of k nearest neighbors so this is also not a linear model it is a known parametric instance based learning algorithms which does not assume the linear relationship between the variables they are trying to uh, look for the positions so how many neighbors are near to one particular neighbor so in that way it tries to cluster those neighbors together so linear regression is the only option where the linear model is considered and linear line is plotted between dependent and independent so that with the help of dependent variables we can predict that what should be the what should be the value of the independent variables how they are related okay so now next question is um sorry yeah so next question is which algorithm would you use for a binary classification task so option a is logistic regression option b is k mean clustering option c is principal component analysis and option d is linear regression so we have already discussed this about binary classification task yeah so you both are right logistic regression we already have seen that it is for the categorical classification and it gives a binary output whereas in case of k mean clustering so it is first of all it is the unsupervised clustering algorithm and it tries to group the data so it will give a clusters not the uh, cl binary classification similarly in principal component analysis so this we have seen during the machine learning model that it tries to reduce the dimensions and then it gives the plot so that maximum difference can be captured with the single x and y axis which will be referred to as principal component 1 and principal component 2 so that maximum uh, difference can be captured in linear regression it is it gives us the continuous values not the binary classification outputs so that's why option a was correct now question number 8 so what is the main goal of predictive analysis so option a is to classify the data into predefined categories option b to find the relationships between the variables option c to predict future outcomes based on historical data and option d to reduce dimensionality of the data set so you have to tell what is the main goal of predictive analysis okay so let's see yeah you both are right so the main goal of predictive analysis is to predict the future outcomes based on the historical data which is present now next question is which algorithm is commonly used in predictive analysis for continuous outcomes so these all questions are somehow linked to one another only so option a is logistic regression option b is linear regression option c is k means and option d is a priori algorithm so just focus on this word also that for the continuous outcomes which is the commonly used predictive analytics okay so now let's see what is the right answer so the right answer is linear regression because we have already discussed that logistic regression as for the uh, binary kind of outcomes and linear regression is for the continuous outcomes so and which is majorly used there are other models or other methods or other algorithms are also available but linear regression is mostly used and k means unsupervised clustering algorithm which we have already seen whereas there is new addition to this is a priori algorithm so which is used for the association rule learning for example in the market when analysis is performed so in that case we use a priori algorithm i'll just check i have slide for this yeah so for example you go to market there are multiple items which are present uh, so what a priori algorithm means that whenever you go to market or you are using amazon app so there are multiple items so it checks that which items are most 
closely present or which items are mostly taken together so in that case I try to aggregate those items together and for example if you are going to a store supermarket you are purchasing for example bread milk eggs together so they will try to classify those items together and whenever next time if you purchase one item so the another item will also be given to you as a preference that if you want it for example in online things so that is in that happens that how many people purchase one item with another item so there are models which capture that information so whenever you try to means purchase that item so they are also provide you link to other items which people generally take together with this so in that case a priori algorithm is mostly used which checks that which items are categorizing together so in that way try to classify all those items try to aggregate them together yeah so is it clear about a priori algorithm and this a priori is also means it requires the information of uh, which is already available so it needs the already available information for example when one person is uh, purchasing other items with one single item so that data has to be there before designing the a priori algorithm so it requires already available data or the historical data you can say and then it will predict the future outcomes or future associations so that is just one example that of the supermarket example otherwise in biology there are other examples also which exist now let's look into the question number 10 which is in predictive analysis what is cross validation used for so option a to prevent overfitting option b to improve the data quality option c to reduce model complexity and option d to enhance the data labeling so you might have seen in the predictive analysis model that it is tenfold cross validation these many cross validations so you have to tell what is matlab what is the purpose why we use it okay so you both have mentioned option a to prevent the overfitting so it is right so when we say cross validation it is a statistical method or a resampling procedure we are you are trying to you are changing the samples to check that how it is influencing your output so it is used to evaluate the skill of machine learning model on a limited data sample so k fold cross validation k fold means k number of times so how many iterations are performed in that way the k value will vary so five iterations are done then five fold cross validation if 10 iterations are done then 10 fold cross validation so more the number of cross validations it is assumed that the model will be better refined although there is limit that beyond that limit you won't be able to further optimize it but still there is since you, you try to do as much number of iterations as much you could do so in the in this case they are performing five iterations in each set they have divided the total data into five different sections in which the test set will be the one section so it will be one fifth and then four fifth will be the training set so in that way they will try to I mean, they are varying this test set and wearing the training set and then they are comparing so in this case it will try to prevent the overfitting because each time you are just wearing your test set so in that case in each and every iteration different parameters will be given different weights and everything so it will be kind of optimized till the end so that's why this is the cross validation yeah now let's look into next question so which of the following is not a performance evaluation metric for predictive models so we have already seen the um, evaluation metrics so option a is precision option b recall option c clustering coefficient and option d is f1 score so this is quite easy yeah yeah so clustering coefficient is not the evaluation metric we already have seen precision recall and f1 score so what clustering coefficient is means what does it mean is that in a network when you study any study any network so i hope you are aware of the network term that in which we have multiple nodes which are represented by circles and there are edges which connect these circles so cluster means whenever multiple nodes are coming together and constitute together and make a cluster so this is referred to as cluster cluster means when multiple nodes are getting connected to one another so this is forming a cluster whereas in this case this one single node is connected to multiple nodes but these nodes are not then connected to one another so th this means 
the clustering coefficient is low whereas if we talk about degree so degree means how many number of edges are present how many connections are present which means degree so in this case there are six degrees for this uh, single node so degrees are although high but still these are not connected these other separate dots are not connected to one another which means clustering coefficient is low so clustering coefficient tells you that what is the probability that my nodes are connected more and more connected for example if i am talking about the gene networks or gene regulatory networks so in those cases what happen is that multiple genes are present together in a pathway they have their role in the pathway so in that case those genes tend to cluster together in the network so this means there are multiple criteria to design these networks so in gene clustering we keep those gene together which are coming in single pathway so in that case we will cluster them together we'll join them to one another so their clustering coefficient will be high so by calculating clustering coefficient we, we can predict that what is the association what is the relationship between those nodes so that means if there is high clustering coefficient which means those nodes are highly connected to one another so that was the main advantage of this clustering coefficient this is also known as a metric in which whenever we are going to analyze the network so in that case clustering coefficient will also be one of the metrics with which we can judge that in my network are there any uh, means um, clusters which are formed and if those clusters are formed what is their clustering coefficient how well they are connected to one another so this is the example of high clustering coefficient and degrees are also high if you can means count for the number of edges number of links then they are also high so this is just a matrix which are representing in this case there are only three edges that means three connections which means degree is low degree is simply number of connections and then if we talk about clusters so in this case there are no clusters the, there are no links between all the three individuals so in, that, in this case clustering coefficient is also low whereas if we talk about this particular network so their degree is also low means five edges are only present five connections are only present but still they all are connected to one another so their clustering coefficient is high so the degree whether we'll call it a low degree or high degree depends because it is a comparative kind of thing when you compare two things then only you can comment that whether degree is low or whether it is high but if we simply look at the five number of connections and if there are four nodes that means that is not a high degree so that's why this is just a metric so i hope it is clear till now about clustering coefficient maybe in the next week content you will read more about these network properties so that in, in that case the clustering coefficient will get cleared that what does it mean so next question is what is the primary challenge in predictive modeling option a risk of overfitting option b lack of training data and option c random sampling and option d data labeling so i think many questions appear as if they are repeating again and again so that is something okay shweta has mentioned option a and according to polemy option b is the primary challenge so the right answer is like a risk of overfitting so actually uh, if you have seen one of the lectures in the session so that might have confused you in which they have mentioned that there is not enough training data available for means means for some of the examples we do not have enough training data but if currently we see the means literature and everything so we have a lot of training data in perspective of per, means predictive modeling we have a lot of data and the issue with, with that is we do not know how to interpret that in which we have multiple values and we we get means, i mean you can say we get over excited or we we get excited and we take try to take all those parameters all those features and we want to make our model the best by looking only at the training data so in that case the risk of overfitting is very high and lack of training data we cannot consider here because this is means this question is in the perspective of predictive modeling and not specific to some of the data sets where the training data is limited for example in case of the current cancer disorders or other things in which we want to go for the functional analysis of genes or we want to go into the detail about the Uh, transcript level information so in that case we have limited data means in that case we have lack of training data that's why we are not properly able to design the predictive models 
because if training data will be less then also it is the problem that how to design a predictive model but in this case this risk of overfitting is taken as the right option because it is a general context because in general terms we have I mean, huge data which is available so that's why in this case primary challenge is risk of overfitting but lack of training data will also not be a wrong option if we, given that we have that particular uh, kind of predictive modeling okay so next question is which of the following is an ensemble technique used in predictive models this also we have discussed option a decision trees option b random forest option c support vector machines and option d k means so ensemble technique means ensemble means when you are combining multiple things that is ensemble when you are adding everything you're combining multiple things so that is ensemble So what do you think which could be the ensemble technique which is used? Okay. Yeah. So we both are right that random forest is the ensemble technique. We already have seen that it uh, includes the multiple information for multiple decision trees. That's why it is known as ensemble technique. Yeah. And I've also added the support vector machine and came in because which we have not discussed yet. So support vector machine means although we have discussed in the previous lecture, so support vector machine is like there are hyperplanes which separate different values which are present. We are this is this comes under the classification problem. So if we are trying to classify the data set, so in that case to classify we need to design or we need to decide the plane which are separating individual entities from one another. So in this case there are multiple hyperplanes which are present. So hyperplane means which are separating two entities from one another. In support vector machine, we try to find those hyperplanes that where those hyperplanes should be present. So this is the example where we have three different classes. Whereas if in this case, this will be a positive hyperplane and this particular distance is known as the margin. So we want that the value should be present away from these margins. Because in these margins, if some value falls, then it becomes a bit difficult to predict. Means so the chances of predictions are means they are prone to errors. So that's why we want the values to be present away from this and these are referred to these points are referred to as support vectors because they are supporting the outcomes so they are just lying at the boundaries of these margins that's why they are referred to as support vectors and any value which will be present inside they will not be means we won't be able to classify them in a better way that's why these are referred to as support vector and these machines in this particular technique is referred to as support vector machines And if we talk about k-means, so in k-means also, from each point, we try to check its uh, distance from other values. Means there are concentric circles which are plotted outside of each point, and then the distance is calculated among all those circles. So the circles which are present close to one another, they are categorized to a single category. Then for all these points, a single position will be calculated, and then its mean will be calculated from all the other points. And this distance will be calculated and its mean will be taken. So that's why the name k mean is given to it. So in this case, it is trying to classify all the entities which are present into the separate classes. So we can also call them as classes or clusters. So this is also the clustering. Similarly, this is also for the categorization or clustering, same thing. Okay, now next question is. What is the purpose of regularization in predictive analysis? So this term was also discussed in this week. So option A is to simplify the model. Option B is to reduce the size of the data set. Option C to balance the bias and variance. And option D to add complexity to the model. So I think you have gone through the L1 regularization or lasso regularizations. So why do we use these regularizations? Okay. So we both are right. We try to buy, I mean, we try to balance the bias and variance. So we have also discussed previously that in overfitting, what happens is that the balance between bias and variance is disturbed. So we want that there should be balance so that we can generalize our parameters and our model. So that's why regularization purposes to balance that bias and variance 
and generate the optimal results. So regularization is a technique which is used in machine learning to prevent the model from overfitting. So you will means hear this term more and more wherever there is the, there are chances of overfitting the training data. So the regularization come into play so that the overfitting can be solved. The problem of overfitting overfitting can be solved. So in simple terms, what regularization will do, it will add a penalty to the model for making it too complex. So by doing this, the model is encouraged to find the simpler patterns that are more likely to generalize well to new data. So that's why it helps to balance between fitting the training data well and being able to perform well on the unseen data, which is kindly hindered in the in terms of overfitting. It does not perform well on the unseen data. So regularization is trying to balance it out. So this is the example that without regularization, it is the overfit. Whereas with regularization, it is known as the good fit. Whereas you are trying to, you are better able to visualize the results in a better way. So the, if you calculate the distance of these points from this line, so there are lesser distance. Although in this case also, the distance is nil. They appears to be very means properly arranged, but whenever new value will come, then this uh, model will fail. So that's why we want to perform regularization so that the distance between the predicted and actual values is as least as possible. But at the same time, it can perform well on the unseen data. Yeah, so this is another example which I have taken from this particular paper. So which mentioned that what are the main ideas? So they have mentioned that what is the problem and what is the solution? So the problem is that the fancier and more flexible machine learning method is the easier is to overfit the training data. So in other words, this they are mentioning this squiggle might fit the training data really well because we can see that uh, so these all values and this green actually green curve line is telling you that what is the actual value. So for example, shoe size and height. So if this is the shoe size, what should be the height? So if you join the value from this point to this point, so this will fall here only. So which means that my on the training data, actual and predicted value are exactly the same. In this case, it appears. So means in case of training, although it will be accurate in case of overfitting because you have all the parameters and you have, you have, you have taken into account all those informations. That's why, but the prediction made with new data. So in this case, they are giving that, for example, if these new values are given and your model is giving you this curve, so it will perform worst because Error is error means that what is your prediction? What is actual value? So actual value is lying somewhere here, but your model is pred predicting it to be here. So which means if you calculate this dis uh, difference or this distance, so it is very high, which means you are performing poorly on the new data. So that's why this is the problem with overfitting the model. So the solution is that one very common solution to deal with overfitting the training data is to use a collection of techniques that can that we call as regularization which reduces how sensitive the model is to the training data. So in this case, they are kind of reducing this squiggle, which was very uh, curved or everything. So they are reducing it. They are regularizing it such that in the first scenario, if we look for the expected and the observed values, so although it appears that there is a, some distance which is present among these values, but still if new value will come, then also there will be lesser distance. So it will perform Similarly, if new values will come, so that's why this is the purpose of regularization that although in the training data also it is not giving me very accurate results, there are some means distance or some error is present, but still with the new data also it will not perform worst. It will perform in the similar way. So that's why this is the purpose of regularization to deal with overfitting. So to balance variance and bias. Now question number 15. Which method helps in feature selection during predictive analysis? Because we have already seen that in overfitting, if we are not properly able to select the features, we are trying to select all those features. So that's why we overfit the data. So there are some methods which helps us to select the features. So option A is gradient descent. Option B is recursive feature elimination. Option C is oversampling and option D is decision trees. So you have to tell the method. Till now, we have already seen what is gradient descent and what are decision trees. And I think oversampling is also clear from its name only. Okay.
yeah so let's see so yeah correct answer is option b which is recursive feature elimination so it's clear from its name recursive means when you are performing something again and again recursively feature elimination so in this case after each and every round you are kind of eliminating the features which might interfere with your predictive analysis so that's why its name is recursive feature elimination so in this case they have taken the example that there is a data set sleep health and lifestyle data set so pre processing is done features are selected and in feature selection recursive feature elimination is technique which is used for the feature selection and then modeling is performed modeling in terms of diffusion tree model they have uh, created and then evaluation performance its performance is evaluated and then output is given that whether there is some disorder or sleep apnea or insomnia is there or not this is just a overview of the big predictive analysis model but in terms of feature selection the technique which is used is recursive feature elimination so now what happened in recursive feature elimination it is the selection method to identify the data sets key features so this is the initial steps train a machine learning model obtain feature importance and remove least important features so in machine learning we have seen that there are multiple features there are some weights which are associated with them so in this case what it will do is that uh, for example if i consider the example of my previous example in which we have used the gradient descent method so in which we try to vary the weights so how to vary weight actually so in that case we add some bias to those weights we prioritize them so that is known as bias with bias we prioritize those weights so bias is also some parameter some value which is added or subtracted from the weight values so in that case there might be some of the features in which the bias will be kind of a value which will be highly negative so that it balance out the weight thing so in this case in rfp what it will do it will check for those features which have limited importance yeah which have least weight so it will remove those features because those features are just means uh, occupying my storage space and making my model complex so i do not want to keep those features because in um, in, in neural networks also if you have multiple features it will take more and more time so in that case we want to eliminate those features which do not have that much importance or which are not that much important which do not have that much weight so we remove them that is referred to as recursive feature elimination and we retrain the machine learning model with the remaining features and then we check the output then we check the result that how much is the dis, uh, difference between the predicted and the actual values so if it is reducing if we are going towards the minima or the minimum distance or the minimum cost value then we will say yes we can remove this feature but if after performing that analysis if we are not able to reduce or if we are increasing the cost value so in that case we will keep that feature so this is how the trial and error kind of thing goes on so that comes under recursive feature elimination so we are recursively removing the features so that better model can be generated so that is known as rfe so now let's move to next question what is marker selection in the context of bioinformatics option a choosing genes that differentiate between the biological states option b labeling the training data option c removing noisy features and option d performing model selection So you have to tell what is marker selection. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. So yeah, option A is correct, which means choosing genes that differentiate between biological states. So in previous sessions also, when we say biomarkers, so in that case, when we were talking about the cancer proteomics, and we were saying that. there are certain means how by proteogenomics is, is important to identify the biomarker so what biomarker means that which can uh, act as a signature or which can signify a particular state through which we can distinguish that whether this person is suffering from cancer and if yes then at which stage he might be so that is known as the marker is like a means whenever in normal terms also when we use marker so why we use marker to distinguish or to separate two values or to highlight something so for that reasons we use marker so similarly marker selection is used in context of bioinformatics for choosing the genes 
that differentiate between the biological states. Yeah, so there was one paper which was published in 2020, so it's, which is about the GM, GMS tools, which means GWAS based marker selection tool for genomic prediction from genomic data. So if we talk about their key takeaway points in which if we talk about genomic prediction, so their study is focused on predicting the phenotypes, which are the observable traits using the genomic data and particularly through SNP markers. So they are just trying to relate that if this particular SNP is observed, then what should be the observable trait? What will be the phenotype? Whether a person will suffer from a cancer or not. So that is referred to as phenotype. And the data which they are using is SNP data. Marker selection challenge is that the accuracy of genomic prediction is highly dependent on the choice of markers. But selecting the best ones for accurate prediction is a difficult task. And this also kind of we have seen previously that although we are saying that SNP is present and this is associated with some phenotype, but we do not know that whether my sequencing is done properly or whether that SNP is properly associated or that is just randomly present. For example, if we talk about the passenger mutations, so there are some mutations which are like passenger mutations. So similarly in that perspective in SNP also, it is means we have to be confident enough to say that this particular SNP is associated with the phenotype. So that in this case, we are using SNPs as a markers so that we can distinguish between the phenotypes. So that's why they are saying that there is a challenge in the selection of these markers. So introduction of GMS tools. So they have designed this tool to select the optimal marker sets and predict the quantitative phenotypes using the combination of statistical as well as machine learning methods. So their tool is kind of trying to look for the optimal markers or optimal SNPs which can distinguish between, between the phenotype, phenotypic traits. So it is based on the gene-wide association studies, which is referred to as GWAS, which utilizes these GWAS to search for the optimal markers heuristically, improving the accuracy of prediction. And they have also mentioned that their tool is performed, which is providing the enhanced prediction performance when they have tested on real data sets with four phenotypes. So it performed better than the traditional methods, which are traditionally used. So that's why they are mentioning that their tool is better. And they have also mentioned that although there are some limitation with GMS tool, but still it will help us in improving the prediction of quantitative traits in organisms. Yeah, so this was all about GMS tool. And if you further want to explore, then here I've provided the link. You can go through this and then they will provide you the link to their particular tool. So you can use it online. So in this case, they will tell you that and the data set which they have selected related to that, they will tell you that what is the association between the SNP and the phenotype. Now let's move to next question. So which statistical method is commonly used for marker selection? Option A is t-test, option B is k-means, option C is logistic regression and option D is reinforcement learning. So I hope if, even if you do not know the right answer, you can use your elimination technique because they have mentioned which statistical method is commonly used for marker selection. Okay, so you have option D. Okay, let's see. So the right answer is the T test because which is a statistical method which is used for the marker selection because k means is for the clustering we have already seen so in this case we are not trying to cluster them we are just trying to identify a marker if we talk about logistic regression so in this case also we do not have the markers from where we have to select that yes it is a good marker it is a bad so there is no binary classification kind of thing which we need here similarly in reinforcement learning also because we do not have the proper marker selection information. So reinforcement learning cannot be used here. Similarly, in this case, t-test is used because in both the sets which we want to segregate from which we want to decide the markers which are expressed, which are trying to distinguish between both the two states. So for that, we use t-test, which is used to compare the means of the two groups of data. So with that, we can select the markers. So t-test is the uh, statistical method which is generally used and not the other options. Now question number 18 is, what is the goal of marker selection? 
So this is also kind of similar to the previous question. Option A is to identify important features for classification. Option B to remove the redundant data. Option C to normalize the data and option D to cluster the data points. Okay, so Polymy has mentioned option B. So the right answer is the goal of marker selection is to identify the important features for classification. So if you have a marker, then you will know that that marker is specific to one particular state because marker is helping you to decide to distinguish between two states. So in that case, it is trying to provide you the information of important features which are important for classification. And to remove redundant data, so redundant data means repetitive data. So marker selection is not for the removal of redundant data. There are other tasks which means other methods which are used to remove this. Similarly, marker selection is not normalizing the data. There are statistical methods which are available for normalizations. And similarly, it's not used for the clustering. It is used for the classifications. And it is kind of a marker which is selective to one particular state so we cannot exactly say to cluster the data points so that's why option a is correct to identify important features for classification now question number 19 so which of the following is a common challenge in marker selection option a high dimensionality of data option b lack of clustering algorithms option c model overfitting and option d unlabeled data So what do you think would be the challenge with marker selection? Okay. Yeah, so option A is right, which means high dimensionality of data. So we have a huge data. So that's why that is the biggest challenge in marker selection. Although we have the clustering algorithms, but that are not generally used for the marker selection. Then model overfitting unlabeled data, they do not make any sense in case of marker selection. So the major concern or major challenge is high dimensionality of data. That means large number of features or covariates are present. And this often exceeding the number of independent samples. So this type of data is common in statistical research and poses challenges in variable selections and model selections due to its complexity and size. So that's why this is the challenge. Now question number 20, which of the following is a potential consequence of poor marker selection? So if you select a poor marker, then what are the chances which can happen? So option A is underfitting, option B overfitting, option C both A and B and option D none of the above. So for example, if you've selected a poor marker, then what are the chances? What will be the output? How will it be influenced? Okay. So the correct answer is both A and B. So it can either underfit your model or it can also lead to overfitting as well. So if marker is, so poor marker selection means that your marker is not proper or not means we cannot confidently uh, distinguish between two states with this marker so that is referred to as poor marker selection so in that case both are the consequence both underfitting as well as overfitting both can happen now next question is what type of validation is critical in marker selection option a internal cross validation option b external validation external validation on independent data sets, option C, random split validation, and option D, grid search. Okay, so how to differentiate between the over and underfit results? So overfit and underfit, if we say, then we talk in terms of the training data, that whether the outputs which are received, whether they are underfit or the overfit but how well you have selected the uh, parameters you can say or the uh, characteristics or features you can say. So with that we 
say that whether my model is underfit or overfit but results will be means they will not be accurate so from results you cannot differentiate results will not be right that's why you are saying that either you have overfit the model or you have underfit the model so for this for differentiating you have to look for the number of features and the training data with that you will be able to distinguish is it clear or do you have some other query okay so actually data you can have a huge amount of data you can have the high dimensional data which is already present with you but if you select only limited number of features or the underfit means that those features which you have selected they are not sufficient enough to provide you or to train the model properly so that is referred to as underfit and the high dimensional that means feature is means high dimensions is a you can say it is a attribute of the entire data that what is the data input data so it is high dimensional that means it has multiple dimensions it has multiple features so that is high dimensional data but although on high dimensional if you select limited number of features which are not enough so that will be referred to as underfit if you select maximum features for trying to com complicate your model then that is referred to as overfit so underfit and overfit are different things and high dimensional data is different things so high dimension data is what you have in your hand and how you are training it that that will means from there you will be able to distinguish that whether it is underfit or overfit so underfit and overfit are kind of attributes of the model that how your model is designed yeah so means these underfit and overfit you will only be able to decide when you will be optimizing it because in machine learning model you have a high dimensional data with multiple features you are selecting it you are giving some weights to each and every feature and then you are making some prediction so you are calculating the you are evaluating your predictions that what is the difference between actual value and a predicted value and you are each and every time you are optimizing it so that that difference could be decreased so in that case you are kind of deciding you are recursively eliminating some features so in that case you will be better able to decide that means even if my predictions are not performing better that means my model is underfit and if uh, in the beginning only before recursively removing if it is not predicting better that means it is overfit yeah so that things comes under this i mean underfitting and overfitting you will only be able to decide when you will check for the outputs generated by the model by taking the test data by taking the new data and then looking for the predictions so the next question was think what type of validation is critical in marker selection internal cross validation external validation on independent data sets random split validation or grid search so I, i think you might not be aware of this okay so let's see so the correct answer is the external validation on independent data sets so first of all the first option was internal cross validation so internal cross validation is a technique in which it splits the training data into subsets to evaluate the performance model's performance helping to prevent overfitting so as we have seen in the previous example that how they have divided the entire data into five different small sections and from which one section was considered to be a test set and other four sections were training set and each and every time the test set which they have considered they are varying that test set means in the first scenario they have taken the first section to be test set in the next iteration they have taken second section to be the test set so they are trying to vary that test set so that the overfitting can be removed so that is known as internal cross validation or we can say k fold cross validation whereas external validation on independent data set means it tests the model on completely independent data which ensures that the selected marker generalizes well to unseen data so in this what they do is they take the independent data sets and then check 
that whether my marker which we have selected whether it is performing better so that is known as external validation which means you are taking the external values and then trying to predict from the from those unseen data and then random split validation means you are randomly splitting so this is somehow related to cross validation only but in this case it is randomly split it is in cross validation you are very sure you have designed those sections and you are selectively taking those sections to be test set and varying between test and training set whereas in random split it will be a randomly split between the test set and training set and each time you are trying to check that whether your marker selection is performing better or not so this is also somehow internal validation kind of thing then grid search so this is a hyper parameter tuning method which is not a validation approach so that's why it is also not considered as a validation type of validation in marker selection so hyper parameter these all terms are linked to machine learning model so I means i don't know whether you are aware of this but hyper parameters are also some of the uh, variables you can say I means these are the add on variables whenever you are trying to optimize something so there is some learning rate or all those things with which you are trying to train your model It means the the differences which you bring about in the weights so each and every time you are bringing some difference to the weight so that your model is optimized so th those values are referred to as hyper parameters which are tuned which are varied among some range so that means by changing those values the distance between the predicted and the as means expected outcome could be reduced that is referred to as hyper parameter and the tuning means varying those values is referred to as hyper parameter tuning so which is for the optimization and which is not related to the validation in the marker selection yeah so now let's move to question number 22 which tool can be used for gene marker selection in high dimensional data option a random forest option b k means option c naive base and option d t t test okay so in this case the right answer is option a which is the random forest so it can be used for the gene marker selection in case of high dimensional data because it will rank the features by importance by using multiple decision trees so in this case we will use the random forest for the high dimensional data so keep this thing also in mind because in t test which was a statistical test which we have used for means in the marker selection in previous questions in this case we will use random forest because it will try to use it will it, it is an ensemble method so in the, in this case in case of high dimensional data it will perform better whereas k mean plus so k mean is a clustering algorithm so it cannot be used in naive base also it is also a classifying algo, classification algorithm so it will also assume the feature to be independent and not designed for feature selection that's why right answer is option a which is random forest now question number 23 why is marker selection important in predictive modeling so to reduce model complexity and improve accuracy to increase the size of data set to change the model architecture or to perform clustering okay now let's see so the right answer is option a to reduce model complexity and improve the accuracy so for that reason we use marker selection because we do not want to for increasing the size so no marker selection is not for increasing the size and marker selection is not to change the model architecture and it is also not for performing the clustering okay now we'll look into the web gestalt and then we'll do a little hands on so what does web gestalt stands for so option a web based gene set analysis toolkit option b web based graph search algorithm option c web based gene sampling tool and option d and none of the above okay yeah so you both are right so it is web based gene set analysis toolkit and this is a detailed picture of this web get stalls so what does it mean it is a web based gene set analysis toolkit and it is a online tool with which if we have a data set then we can check that whether is there any function enrichment or is there any gene for example if you provide a list of genes so in that you can study that whether there are some functional enrichment between that genes whether those genes are interacting with one another there is some regulations which are present 
But for example, you can also provide the protein list. So from that, you will be able to identify the protein-protein interactions. Or for example, if you have the uh, expression information with you, other statistical information also with you, then you can also perform the gene set enrichment analysis. So for that reasons, you can use WebGestalt. And it helps the researchers to interpret the large scale biological data because our main aim, is to, main aim is to interpret the data because we have a huge data. For example, we have a gene expression data. Now, how to interpret it? So, we can use this tool and it will help us to identify biological functions, pathways. It can also tell us that, for example, we have a list of genes and we are using WebGestalt. So, it will tell us that what are the features, what are the pathways in which my genes are involved. So in that case, we can use it for analysis. It will also tell you the categories which are significantly overrepresented. For example, if you are taking uh, samples from kidney. So in kidney samples, you have the list of genes which are present. Now you want to study, means how, you, how will you go further? So in that case, you can use WebGestalt. So it will tell you that, okay, these, these genes are present. These, these are the pathways in which these genes are involved. So with that, you will get some idea. Okay, so these pathways, might be going on in the kidney. That's why these genes are present. And you can also see that it will, means how it predict all these things because it, it will be taking a background set or a reference set. So background set will be entire human genome. So entire genes which are present. So with that, it will compare that, okay, which genes are overrepresented. So in that case, it will tell you, okay, these genes are overrepresented. These genes are means observed in kidney, which means these might be essential for the kidney functionality. That's why they are overrepresented. If we compare it to the entire human genome, so all those analysis can be done with the WebGestalt. So it integrates several public databases and provide various analysis methods. So there are other databases which contain the pathway information, which contain um, ontologies, information of functions, all those databases are present. So what WebGestalt is doing, it is kind of collaborating with other. It is kind of means taking information from all those servers and providing you information. So it's a single platform where you can access multiple information at one place. So there are different enrichment analysis methods. First is ORA, which is overrepresentation analysis. And you will see that by default, ORA is being selected. Whereas you can also select NTA, which is network topology based analysis. So in ORA, it identify biological pathways or functions which are overrepresented in a list of genes. So in this case, you have to provide a gene list and it will tell you which pathways or which functions are overrepresented. So in the hands-on uh, session, you'll see that how different things can be seen. Then comes uh, NTA. So in NTA, as the name suggests, network topology. So in this case, it involves the network information and try to analyze that which genes are important. So as we have seen that in network, there are some nodes and some connections. So the gene which is making maximum number of connections, it means that that gene is very important. If we remove that gene, if we knock down that gene, then all other connections which it make might get influenced. So in that case, that is one of the idea which we can get from the network topology based analysis. Then comes gene set enrichment analysis. So in this case, it examines the ranked gene lists to identify enriched gene sets at the top or the bottom of the list. So in this, you provide some values, some scores. With that, it will be ranking your gene list that which genes are enriched and which gene sets are not enriched. So that is GSEA. Then comes database integration. So it integrates um, the data from multiple databases such as Gene Ontology, CAG, React, Tom, and there are many, many other databases from where it takes the information and it integrates that information. And then if you talk about the input, so in this particular tool, you can provide input either a gene list or a protein list or along with the gene and protein list, you can also provide some other values. For example, enrichment scores, if you have the expression values or all those things. So that is the input which is provided. Then comes visualization. So in this case, the visualization it provides is that can either be in the form of graphical output such as bar graphs or network diagrams or enrichment maps. So with those visual representations, you will be able to interpret your data in a better way. So we can overall, we can say that it is a tool which helps you to explore the functional significance of genes or proteins, which you have derived from high dimensional data or high throughput experiments, such as RNA-seq, proteomics, or other type of omic studies. So for that purposes, you can use WebGetStalls. And there are three different methods which we have discussed. So I have provided a, I mean, 
table comparative analysis among them that what are the main advantages of each and every method what is the purpose of this method what input it needs and what are the statistical assumptions that what it assumes so if you want to study them in detail then you can go through the slide otherwise it's not required yeah so now we'll discuss few questions related to that only so now question number 25th is which of the following is commonly used analysis in web gestalt so option a over representation analysis option b k mean clustering option c cross validation and option d gradient descent yeah it's obviously over representation analysis other terms are not linked with web gestalt next question is which method of web gestalt requires statistical values for analysis ore nta gse and none of the above yeah so right answer is option c gsea gene set enrichment analysis yeah you both are right now next question is which of the following web gestalt methods can be run without statistical values so option a ore option b nta option c gsea or option d none of the above so in this more than one option can also be correct yeah you both are right so option a and b and one more thing which i want to add that in this question they have asked that which method can be run without statistical values so even if you do not provide statistical values then also you can run but even if you provide this statistical values then also you can use these methods so keep this thing also in mind that with statistical values also you can run these methods because with statistical values you will get more insights so more analysis can be done with those gene sets but without statistical values also you can run the ora and nta they simply require gene list or either protein list or protein interaction list in case of nta so that it can design the network so next question is what type of input does web gestalt primarily accept yeah so st statistical value is important because gsea is gene set enrichment analysis so in this case you need some enrichment score from by looking at number of genes how will you able to look for the enrichment so in that case you require some of the statistical values so that you can compare for rank you can rank them because in ora it is simply over representation analysis that which genes are over represented but in gene set enrichment analysis you require some enrichment score through which you can rank them and then perform that analysis so that's why it requires statistical values so enrichment is something else enrichment here is not to extract the values enrichment means which genes are more enriched yeah which genes are more expressed for example if i want to study a kidney a genome that in kidney which are the genes which are majorly expressed so in that case i want to look at their expression values or means for example in this case i'm talking about the expression but there are other features also which you can study so in this case if i want to compare the expression so i need some expression values through which i will be able to uh, identify the gene set which is enriched which genes are enriched in this particular organ so that's why we require the statistical value so that we can rank them we can compare that these are enriched and these are not enriched but in ora it is simply it simply requires the name of the gene which are present so that's why in gsea for enrichment we need some score values otherwise with following it simple gene names we cannot perform this enrichment analysis yeah so next question is what type of input does web gestalt generally accept for gene set analysis option a protein or genes list option b time series data option c unlabeled data and option d image data there are some options which you can simply eliminate yeah you are right so the correct answer is option a which is proteins or gene list so these are the inputs which are generally accepted but along with this other information can also be present for example time series data so in gene set enrichment analysis only or in other analysis also what you can do is you can also see that which genes are expressed in which stage of development so that is referred to as time series data in one sense if that is the perspective so for 
that's why in gene set enrichment analysis we require some values so this is the add on data time series data unlabeled data so unlabeled means that is not labeled at all and image data is also not required here because we are not comparing among two images so right answer was protein or gene list next question is which of the following web gestalt analysis identifies enriched biological pathways so option a is ora option b nta option c gfea and option d pca okay yeah we have already discussed that in over representation analysis it identifies enriched pathways this is true next question is what is the purpose of network topology based analysis in web gestalt option a to analyze the structure and connections in biological networks option b to perform clustering of gene sets option c to reduce dimensionality and option d to tune model hyperparameters yeah this is also right because network topology based is to analyze the structure and connection in the biological networks which could either be gene regulatory networks genetic networks protein interaction networks or any kind of networks so for which we can use nta now which database is commonly integrated with web gestalt for gene set analysis so option a keg option b pca option c arima and option d cnn okay let's answer this so option a keg we have already seen that keg reactome so such databases are integrated to web gestalt for the gene set analysis it is uh, generally tells you the i think it's uh, full form is kyoto encyclopedia of genes and you know so all the pathway kind of information is kept in the keg so for that you can integrate this information next question is which web gestalt method focuses on comparing experimental gene sets with predefined gene sets so gsea nta pca or ora i don't know why they have kept pca here Okay, so its its right answer is option A, G S E A, because you are comparing experimental gene sets with the predefined gene sets. So sets term is used. That's why G S E A is gene set enrichment analysis. So in this case, enrichment scores which you have provided, they are compared with the predefined gene sets, and then and after comparisons, you decide that which of the genes are enriched in the set. So that's why this is focused on G S E A. So GSE is focused on those analysis. Next question is which statistical test is often used in ORA, that is over representation analysis in Web Gestalt. So option A hypergeometric test, option B t-test, option C ANOVA, and option D Fisher's exact test. Uh, yeah, you. actually you both are right fisher's exact test so fisher exact test come under the category of hypergeometric test so that's why means you means even option d is right in this case it is not highlighted because hypergeometric test is a broader term that's why so there could be other tests also which might be used but yeah option d is also right so fisher's exact test is generally used to check or to be used in the ora and here is one of the example which is given that if there is a question that what is the probability of finding five uh, sorry four or more black genes in a random sample of five genes so this is the question these are the background population in which we have 500 black genes and 5000 red genes and this was our question these are the genes which, which is given so for over representation analysis we use the fisher exact test to check that what is the over representation which means to answer this question we use the fisher exact test and they comes under hypergeometric test and when we say hypergeometric test so it signifies that it is a statistical test and the statistical test there are multiple statistical sets and fisher's exact test is one among them now we will quickly look into the i mean the server of web based gene set enrichment about this hypergeometric test question or its previous question
gene set enrichment analysis that why it's not or and why it is dsca this question okay yeah so this of uh, um now i'll take one example that in this case how it is comparing experimental gene sets and predefined gene sets so for example i have a list of genes and from all those genes uh, i designed the gene set so gene set means the set of genes which are kind of enriched in one particular pathway or one particular organ that is referred to as gene sets so for designing those gene sets i have some sample which i have collected and i will look for the expression of all those genes now those expressions can be either from the transcript level expression or protein level expression for example if rna seq is done then it will give me the transcript level expression if uh, a mass spectrometry is done then it will give me the protein level expression so those expression scores or some other methods also which for example immunohistochemistry analysis all those analysis with which protein identification is done and then protein quantification is done so from all those analysis what i can do is i will have a statistical value i can also have multiple statistical values i will compare among different genes and from all those values which i have obtained i will design a gene set that these set of genes are enriched or these set of genes are I mean, under represented or not expressed that much so to compare means to identify that these genes are enriched how will i be able to say that these genes are enriched so for that i need some control from which i can compare that this is the basal level expression this which is must be which must be present and this is my expression which i observe so for that we require a predefined gene set which already have some scores which are present and then i will compare from my scores that whether there is a variation among both these sets so with that i will be able to say that okay my gene set genes are enriched so enrichment means when you are comparing something and you are saying that your expression is greater or for example you are saying that these genes if present in overall anywhere in the human so this is the expression whereas if we compare it with the kidney expression of gene so its, it's, it's expression is comparatively higher so with that you will be able to comment that these genes are enriched or these genes are over expressed comparatively so that's why we are saying that in gsea we are doing this that for enrichment we we are trying to compare among the uh, predefined gene set and the experimental gene set by looking at the difference we were able to say that this is enriched so is it clear yeah so in ora what we do is that for example um it is kind of over representation analysis so in this we only give the genes for example in human genome we have 10000 genes out of which i only observe 10 genes in kidney for example so i will check that what is the random chance that i will get those 10 genes is it completely random or is it just means it is not by chance there are some bias or there is some kind of force which is acting that selectively 10 genes are selected so that comes under ora then from simple gene i'm just checking that what is the probability whether those genes are over represented or they are just randomly selected so in such scenarios we do not have to compare it with some gene sets we are simply doing the um, you can say the probability kind of thing so means we are not calculating the statistical scores which we do in the gsea so that comes under ora that we are not looking into the statistical comparison but we are saying that what is the random chance that those genes have shown up in kidney and not in other tissues so that is ora that we have a background list that these are the total genes and what are the chances of seeing those genes so with that ora is generally calculated in some cases it might be confusing among the experimental and the predefined concept because in ora you might be confused with this concept that we are taking the background set in case of ora also we require the background information that what are the total genes present in the genome pool in the human genome so that is bit different from the this uh, experimental gene set and predefined gene set there is a minor minor differences among them 
but in all of the, them we require some kind of background information and ORA also we require the background gene list and then we compare that the probability of this gene is kind of higher and why these only genes are coming so with that we try to look for ORA okay so then let's see the web based gene set analysis is it fine let's proceed with this or yeah so in this you will be completely cleared with all the concepts related to web gestalt so this is the home page so what you can see in the home page is that there are some basic parameters in which there are multiple methods which are present such as ORA, GSEA, NT, NTA. So you can select any method from them. Then second thing is organism of interest. So from here you can select the organism whichever you are interested in. There are some organisms which are given. Then functional database. So from here you will be able to select multiple functional databases which are present. In later side we'll see. Then if you see here, so there is a list in which you can provide your gene list. So for example, if I only want to perform ORA or NTA, then I can simply give the gene list or the protein list. But if uh, for GSEA, I have to provide the list along with some scores or the st uh, statistical values which are present. Then in the select reference set, so in the reference set, I have to select the reference. For example, if I am taking the human as my organism of interest. So in that, that case, my reference set will be the human genome. So from here, it will give me the list of organisms as well as their genome assemblies or other information. So I will select reference set and ID will be uh, depending on the file, means file you upload. It will try to itself identify that whether it is a gene ID or it is a protein ID. So it will itself identify it. Similarly in reference also it will identify it itself and then you can sub, um, click on the submit. And if you want to further explore some other parameters then you can also select the advanced parameter options. And here it has provided some of the examples. So in case if you do not have the data and if you simply want to check that how the data is given here, so you can select these options. And in that way, it will tell you all these informations. Now let's see. So in this case, I have explored each and every section. So first of all, the method thing. So you can select any one method. So in this case, by default, OR is selected. Now in organism of interest, these are the organism, total organisms. So there are generally 12 organisms. Then comes the other option. So other option is like, for example, if I want to work with Homo sapiens as well as mouse, or if I have some new organism. So in that case, I can select others. Then next thing is functional database. So in functional database, you can select gene ontology, pathway, network, disease, phenotype, chromosomal location, community contributed, cell types, and others if you want to include multiple functional databases so with this you will be able to identify for example i have a large data set of genes so i want to specifically study the pathways so in that case i can simply select pathway for example if i want to know the what is the biological function of those genes so i can simply select gene ontology so depending on what i need i can select any one of the functional database if in the gene set I want to see that what are the diseases these genes are expressed, so I can select disease. So it can either tell me about the disease in which it is involved or either about the drugs or other things. So this is about the functional database. Now if I select gene ontology, then in the bottom you will see that what information you want to get. So in this case, biological process, biological process known redundant, cellular component, Cellular component non redundant, molecular function, molecular function non redundant. So, so no redundant. So, in this case, what happens is in gene ontology, there are three main features which are linked to gene ontology. One is its biological process, that in which process that gene is expressed, its cellular component, that in which component of the cell it is expressed. So, for example, in the membrane or in the nucleus in the Golgi in the ER so that comes under cellular component that where my gene is expressed then third thing is molecular function so what function it is involved in for example replication repair so that comes under function then uh, this non redundant means that in this case the redundancy will be removed redundancy means repetitions so if I want to remove the repetitions I can select biological process non redundant and here is the explanation. So if you keep your cursor in any of these, so it will provide you option. 
information that from where this information is coming because as we have seen that it is integrating multiple databases so in that case they have mentioned that they have taken this information from geneontology.org so there is another server or another database which is already present which contain this information so from there they have taken this information now if i select pathway okay why we need redundancy for other options? Where where you have seen redundancy for other options? Means why we have simply biological process and why we have biological process no redundancy? That you are asking that okay. So non redundancy means, uh, for example, what can happen is that uh, in my gene one gene can be involved in multiple different biological processes so in that case what can happen is that that gene will be again and again coming so whenever the output is generated so that gene will be in a repetition it will be present in a repetition so to remove that uh, because in this ontology thing is not very straightforward because these functions are very you can say they are very deep down for example if a Protein is an enzyme. So in enzyme also we have six different classes. Under those six different classes, we can also have another add-on features, such as which substrate it acts with. Then under that also we can have different categories. So in that case, what can happen is that in ontology, when we are trying to annotate those gene information, so even if a little change in the information is present, that gene will again come up. For example, transferases with this substrate. And then again, if it acts with another substrate, then again the transferase will come and another substrate will come. So in drone redundant, what it will try to do is that it will remove those uh, redundancies. So in that case, it will give only the, that gene only once. So first thing is that. But if you want to look into the detailed value that if you want to go to the entire de depth of that, so that's why you can go to simply biological process so that even if those redundancies are there, but it will provide you detailed information. So you can select this biological process option. This non-redundant option is just that you do not want to go into that depth. Your simple work is to just overview the main main biological processes. Yeah, so that's why we have this. Okay, now let's see. Next. So in the previous, as you have seen, I have selected gene ontology. Now what happened if I select pathway? So in pathway, it will tell you different databases from where you want to get your information. So there are KEG, Panther, Reactome, WP pathway, figure, OCR. So there are different databases which keep the information of pathways and I can select at which of the uh, database I want to take information from. So, okay. So if I select KEG, then I will get the information which is already available on the keg whereas if uh, i select panther then the information in panther and these databases are also kind of taking information from other resources as well so you can either go through them if you want to go otherwise it depends on us that which database we are more comfortable with or means you can again and again select different databases and then check your results because in this you do not have option that you select all the databases at the same time. And whereas if you want, then I think this plus can help you to involve multiple databases, I guess. Then next is network. So if you select network, then if there are multiple databases which provide you network information. So you can select anyone from them. And if you will keep your cursor on these options, and it will also define you in entire detail that what kind of information from where it has collected and what information is present. For example, in CPTAC proteomics BRCA, which is specific for breast invasive carcinoma. So the network information will be specific to that breast cancer. Now next is disease. So if you select disease, then there are two databases from where it has integrated the information. One is DisGeneNet and one is OMIM. So DisGeneNet contains the information of all the disease genes, disease gene network. And OMIM means online Mendelian inheritance in man. So in this, in the human, which are the genes which are linked with the inherited disorder. So that information will be present. If you select phenotype, then there is only one database it has taken information from, which is human phenotype ontology. 
you can also select chromosomal location so in that the database is cytogenic band so cytogenic band means it will tell you that which chromosomal position that gene is present and which arm p q and what is the band position so it is like of in coordinate information as we were seeing in igv so similarly that information will be provided for the genes and then if you select community contributed so it will tell you the community gene community which is present so biological states or processes where your gene is expressed so that information and these are the few of the databases from where they have gathered this community contributed information which is contributed by people okay and then cell type it has human cell landscape from where you can get cell type information and then others so when you select others which means you can select multiple of these functional databases and with others you can select multiple databases such as in this case i have selected gene ontology and in gene ontology i have selected biological process so if i click on plus then i can also select other options as well for example pathway also i can select and you can also provide your own functional database as well for example if you already have annotations then you can give it and then also it will be able to analyze okay so now let's move that how to uh, perform the analysis on this so first of all you know, i have selected method then i have selected organism so i want to study homo sapiens and i want to look for the gene ontology so that's why i have selected gene ontology and in gene ontology also i want to just look into the biological process now input is provided here so in this case my information is about the genes or the proteins so i can also provide the information of metabolites or post translation modifications or others means some other type of information so which you can read from here so now upload list so you can click on the upload and then from the your system you can select a file so in this case i have selected this input file which is a simply a protein list so in this case it has already picked up the id type which is uniprot swissprot so uniprot swissprot is the id in uniprot is a protein sequence database so it, the ids will be the uniprot swissprot ids which will have some kind of a uh, id type so which is uniprot but in i think in your assignment they might have provided you the genes list in that case id type will be picked up by default then next step is to select the reference set so in reference set these are the different informations which are given so means even i i don't know about the detail of all these so by default you can select first option or uh, you can look into this so there are different means experiments are performed and different uh, values are taken so this fe refers to fe matrix exome biobanks so is each and every whenever someone performs some genome entire genome analysis so they take that information and store it in and store it somewhere so there are multiple references which are available so we can select any of them and if you want means if you are performing some experiment then you have to read them in detail that how they have performed what method they have used and what is the accuracy of their method so with that you can select your reference set in this case i have selected the ram db genomics which was listed in the top so yeah okay then you have to click on submit so after clicking on submit it will take some time to perform your job and then at last it will provide you the job summary in which it will tell you that which method you have used which organism and what are the gene enrichment categories which you have selected and then uh, the input file which you have given what was the id type now it will give you the summary that what are the output so they mentioned that there are 179 user ids in which 177 user ids are unambiguously mapped to 177 unique entries ids so entries gene ids are some other type of ids which are given by ncbi and two user ids could not be mapped to entries gene ids so as they have used the goslim goslim is a database which kind of for each gene it provides the uh, its ontology which could either be biological process cellular component or molecular function so goslim is another tool so in this case because in goslim also they have some ids so in that case goslim takes entries gene ids that's why what this particular tool is doing because i have provided uniprot ids so they are trying to convert my uniprot ids into entries ids so that after those entries ids are obtained they can search them in the goslim 
so that's why they are saying that out of my 179 ids they were able to map 177 and two were, could not be mapped so now for 177 only they have performed the analysis they have given it to ghostlim and compared that in how they are relating so they have mentioned that among 177 un unique entries ids 137 ids are annotated to the selected functional category and are also in the reference list which are used for enrichment analysis so reference list is given from the ram db genomics so in ram db genomics also they might have some number of genes so that's why each and every after each and every step my number of genes is decreasing so they are saying that reference list was having 13064 entries ids and 11071 ids are annotated to the selected functional categories that are used as reference for the enrichment analysis now here they have mentioned the parameters so minimum number of ids in the category maximum number of ids in the category fdr method and significance level so in the output they are giving me top 10 ids so this is their result and bar chart of the biological process categories they have also provided for the cellular component and molecular function categories and in this they have mentioned top 10 categories which are majorly expressed so metabolic process biological regulation response to stimulus so with this if i have a large data then i can see that which of the biological properties are over represented similarly for cellular component also i can see that uh, whether it is so for example in this case membrane is the maximum and after membrane protein containing complex is the next and if we talk about molecular function so the highest function is shown by in the protein binding and ion binding so with this i will be able to identify that in my list the, these are the most enriched or most majorly expressed features okay so if i further scroll down then i'll be able to see the bar chart in which they have provided the enrichment ratios as well as the uh, different molecular functions or different processes in which it is involved so electron transport chain protein rna complex organization so in this case it is combining all the gene ontology values and then telling you that what is the enrichment score so means what are the major features or major ontologies which maximum number of genes are involved in so with which enrichment ratio is calculated this enrichment because enrichment is a general term so this is not that enrichment as we talk about in gene set enrichment analysis but this is the another enrichment of these features in the given list of genes and in this case the analyte which is a lectin enriched analyte set so one of the set is selected and then other values are given fdr p value so this these values are just for the statistical uh, perspective that whether the predictions which are made they are right or not so that for that reasons we must look into the p values fdr that fdr should be as low as possible and as well as p value should also be low and this is the gene set and the mapped inputs and then if you click on the volcano plot then it will also tell you about the expression of these genes that whether they are over expressed or if they are under expressed then they will be uh, present towards the left so in this top 10 highly enriched genes are given in this case yeah so now you can also select it as description so in the previous it was as gene set so in this gene gene ontology ids were given whereas if you click on description so in that case they will describe that id that rna localization nuclear transport so that you can also see if we click on dhe so it will provide a network kind of thing in which they have linked different genes that how they are how different pathways are connected how different things are linked to one another so that for that reasons you can select dag option also and then if you further click down then it will also provide you the list so this was the list which is given by me so these were the uniprot ids and then it has converted it into the gene symbols and then their gene names and then entries ids so this is kind of a mapping mapping the gene ids converting them into the other ids because other databases they might store information in other IDs so that's why this conversion is important so because Goslim use entries gene IDs that's why this conversion was done so I can download this list yeah so in this way you can completely analyze the data which you have so is it clear this was it for today's session
okay fine then we'll end the session and in the next session we'll be looking into the network analysis in more detail so then it you will get more clearer picture that what all these things mean okay then if there are no further doubts then i'll end the session and see you in the next week okay thank you so much